Hello everybody and welcome to Independent Art Storytime. We're back with another instalment of The Box of Delights by John Maysfield and today we're reading Chapter 8, Part 2. For a quick recap, the Archbishop has been scrubbled, Kay and Peter have gone to discover what really is happening at the Missionary College at Chester Hills and now Peter's been scrubbled too. He reckoned up the chances and decided that there would be safe to follow after these people, whoever they were. They had got Peter and were removing him, and the chances were that they wouldn't be expecting anybody else, and so it would be safe to follow in that direction. He had not gone far before he heard the noise of oars on the lake, and going down towards the water and peering through the branches, he saw that a boat was pulling towards the mansion on the other side of the lake. In the stern sheets of the boat, there was something that looked like a roll of blanket. That's Peter Scrubbled, Kay thought, and two sinister-looking men in black cloaks were at the oars. Two sinister-looking men were sitting at the stern sheets beside the bundle, and one of them was steering, and the other was trailing for Pike. They've got Peter all right, Kay thought, and then he wondered, should he go to the village of Hope under Chester's and rouse the police there? And then he thought, no, the policeman is probably one of the gang and I should be arrested for trespassing. I'll get home and speak to the inspector and perhaps by that time there'll be word from Caroline Louisa. He took up his box of delights and pressed the knob. A sort of whirlwind plucked him up above the treetops and snatched him south eastwards to the box tree walk at Sea Kings where he landed gently upon his feet. He found the other children at breakfast. You're very late, Kay, Mariah said. Have you seen the latest? No, he said. What is it? Something like a mystery, Mariah said. Here, and she unfolded the paper for him. In the middle page were large black headings. Mysterious disappearance. The Mary Dean disappears. Dean of Tatchester missing since tea time. Ecclesiastical and other circles have been convulsed at Tatchester by the strange disappearances of the well-known dean of the precincts. It appears that the dean went out for a walk shortly after dark last night in response to what he said would be an urgent summons, and has not yet been heard of. He was first missed at 6pm when he should have attended a meeting connected with cathedral business, but it was not until he failed to return to the deanery for dinner that the family became concerned. At the time of going to press, no news has been received of, of, of the reverend gentleman. It is feared that the deanery has been the victim of a motor car accident, but we are entitled to our own conviction that the disappearance of the reverend gentleman coming so soon after the disappearance of his grace, the bishop, the, um, the crimes are perpetrated by some local gang. Until a late hour, the cathedral clergy were indefatigable in their search for their friend, who is perhaps the most popular figure in the establishment. Something like a reign of terror exists at this moment throughout Tatchester. The police preserve a becoming reticence in the matter, and though they scout the notion that the reverend gentleman has been the victim of a practical joke, they abstain from committing themselves to any definite theory. It is hardly necessary to remind our readers that the Dean of Tatchester is the well-known of possible oriental influences in ancient philosophies, as well as the famous handbook Cheerfulness in Christian Duty. We are sure that we voice the feelings of the rest of the world when we wish that Christmas at the deanery may be gladdened by his speedy return to the bosom of his family. Now what do you think of that? Mariah said. That's the gang that scrubbled me! And I believe they've scrubbled Peter, Kay said. And as soon as I've had some breakfast, I'll go round to the police station. Ooh, I love to see sleuths at work, Mariah said, so I'll come too. They went round and the inspector welcomed them. Come in, Mr. Mariah, come in, Master Kay. And he said, T what is it now? More clues for the law to follow? And Kay told his story and all his suspicions. Ha, the inspector said, and footprints in the mud, you say, and the roll of blankets in a boat. But you know, Master Kay, you ought not to have gone trespassing at the Chester Hills. I was there as a young man and it's a dangerous place. They have a lot of those holes they like to call dings, like old mines. Lots of folk break their necks going into them, and I hope your Master Peter hasn't gone and done that. 
but you're quite wrong, Master K, in saying that the principal of the training college is a Mr Brown. It's the father, Boddledale, and as I told you, I will telephone him now. He telephoned. Is that you, Your Reverence? he asked. I am the Inspector of Police speaking, and I want to ask if you've seen anything of a lad aged ten by the name of Peter, who was out at your place this morning. You haven't seen him? Hasn't been seen at all? Thank you. And have you a gentleman by the name of Abner Brown? No. You don't know the name? You train simply young man for parish and missionary work? Isn't that so, Your Reverence? Well, you will forgive me disturbing you at your good work, but duty is a policeman's watchword, and I'm sure you'll understand, sir, that I'm much obliged. I'm sure, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. I wish the same to you. Now, you see, Master K, he said, hanging up the telephone, they know nothing of Master Peter there, but it's my belief about boys, Master K, that leave them alone and they'll come home. K thanked him, and they returned home. Pompous old ass, Maria said. He's a jolly good chap, really, Kay said, and he may be quite Sherlock Holmes, but he's most awfully good about rabbits. As they went into the little street, more newsboys came rushing from the station, shouting, Special edition of the Tatchester Times! Another disappearance! Cannons of Tatchester disappear! Special! Murder gang suspected! Special! Bloodhounds on the trail! What clergyman is safe? Special! Another dreadful religious mystery. And there you are, Maria said. Kay bought a paper, for which the boy charged him sixpence, and he read the little sheet, which was still wet from the press. We feel that this morning's events are so extraordinary that we are warranted in making them the subject of a special edition of our paper. Last night, before our last deservedly popular prelate was torn from us, last night the world's dean as we may have called him, similarly disappeared. Early this morning, while they were walking back from an early morning sermon, Canon Honeytongue and Canny Barnblossom, his friend, were met, we learned, by a messenger, who told them that the Dean had met with a motor accident, and was suffering from a slight concussion, and was asking eagerly to see them. The reverend gentleman then hurried to the waiting car, and, on asking the driver how long they would be, were told less than an hour. They called their friends, others of the cathedral clergy who were accompanying them through the close, that they would be back in time for breakfast. After this car, a Rolls Royce, according to some, a large Daimler, according to others, drove away rapidly. At that early hour, few people were about, and no one seems to have taken the number of the car. The anxiety of the people of Tatchester may be judged when the breakfast hour passed without any message whatsoever from the missing cannons and becoming more seriously alarmed, Mrs Honeytong telephoned to the police, who at once instituted a widespread inquiry, and so far, we regret to say, without result. Though some people are inclined to believe that our cathedral clergy have been the victims of a practical joke. These events are so strange, and follow so closely upon the burglary of the powis, that serious people may be excused for having the gravest of misgivings. We ask all inhabitants of the diocese to come forward at once, in aiding the police by reporting the movements of all cars likely to have been concerned in the removal of the reverend gentleman. The car is reported to have been a large black, dark blue or dark brown or even dark green or dark grey saloon, with a clean-shaven driver in a smart suit. Anyone who's seen a car of the country roads in these hours between 5 and 7.30 in the morning are asked to telephone at once to the Chief of Tatchester Constabulary. Telephone number, Tatchester, 7000. In the meantime, we would convey to all members of the Cathedral Establishment our heartfelt sympathies with their anxieties. We also reprehend in the strongest terms all those who venture to criticise the work of our splendid police force. We are sure, what indeed we have never doubted, that they have the matter well in hand, and though it's against the public interest that they should divulge at this juncture, to the point to which their investigations have proceeded, it is an open secret that they are in possession of certain clues which may lead to startling denouements in the near future. Now what do you think of that? Maria said. 
Wait a moment, Kay said. There's some stop press news here at the side. Stop press news. The rumour currently that the missing prelate was seen near Chester Hills last night turns out to be without foundation. The gentleman mistaken for the bishop was the Reverend Father Boddledale of the Ecclesiastical Trading College who has long been known as the bishop's double. Father Boddledale went yesterday afternoon with the clergy's Christmas offerings to the children in the village school of Hope under Chester's and wearing cleric clerical dress was again mistaken for the prelate. No reliable information has reached the authorities about any of the missing dignitaries. Well, what do you think of that? Mariah repeated. Well, I don't know what I think of it, Kay said. They've got the bishop, they've got the dean, the Punch and Judy man, two canons and Peter in that den of theirs in Chester Hills. Well, if I were you, I'd telephone the yard, Mariah said. It's no good going to your champion rabbit man or whatever it is. Go to the sleuth whose job it is to sleuth. Let's telephone the yard. They telephoned to the yard, who referred them to the chief of Chatchester Constabulary, telephone number Tatchester 7000. And when they did this, they were told that the matter would be met with every attention and that no news had come about the missing gentleman. They expected developments before the evening. At lunchtime, Kay was called to the telephone, and Caroline Louise's sister wanted to speak about her brother, who was now better. Kay explained that Caroline Louisa had not yet returned from London, and had left no word, neither written nor telegraphed. Well, the sister said, she set off from here two days ago. Whatever can have happened? Kay had a very shrewd suspicion about what would have happened. Perhaps she's been kidnapped like the cathedral staff. The sister said, That doesn't sound very likely to me, but I will telephone to the hospitals to find out whether anybody has brought, been brought in as a result of an accident. And she said she would telephone later if she heard anything. She did telephone later to report that she could learn nothing of her sister whatsoever. Kay went back to lunch feeling very miserable. <sighs> and after lunch, it came on to rain and there was no news of Peter. It wasn't possible to go playing in the garden, so he went upstairs to his room, locked the doors, put caps over the keys before, as before, and climbed under the valance of the dressing table, and looked again into the box of delights. This time he looked into an entirely different scene. There was a little hill with a beech clump upon it, and a vixen playing with her cubs on some tumble chalk outside a burrow. A badger was padding about, and from the glow on the wood it seemed to Kay to be about sunset on a fine May evening. The cubs rolled over and over, playing with themselves or with a bit of rabbit skin, and presently Kay was aware that some of the glow upon the trees was due to the presence of multitudes of butterflies in the most brilliant colours. Painted ladies, red admirals, peacocks, purple emperors, chalk blues, commas, tortoise shells, purple and green hair streaks, and beside these there were others, Camberwell beauties and swallow tails, and all these began moving suddenly towards him, and he noticed they were drawing an airy chariot made out of rose leaves for some sweet briar rose. It was liker to a basket than a chariot, and although it looked very fragile, it was held together with silk. And Kay said to himself, silk really is the strongest of all stuffs and he stepped into the chariot. At once the butterflies lifted him up high above the treetops, going much more swiftly than he would have thought possible, and though their flight wavered now up and down, it was extraordinarily delightful. Of course, he said, we're going to Chester Hills. And very soon they were indeed flying over the very foot wood from which Peter had disappeared. But inside the wood and all around the great house as Kay grew near, there were wolves, running and snarling with their hackles up and their teeth gleaming. He never thought it possible that there could be so many. He saw them leaping and snapping and trying to reach the butterflies who kept well out of harm's way. They floated up to the great house and then round it and through the wolves came out of the chimneys and through trapdoors onto the roofs and yap yapped and snarled and showed their teeth. Then at one little window, as Kay floated past, he saw Caroline Louisa stretching out her hands to him, calling, Help me, Kay! 
and then instantly two great she-wolves grabbed her from the window and pulled down the iron shutter. The butterflies changed their direction and floated away from the Chester Hills and at last brought Kay to a bare mountain which he'd never seen before. In the mountainside there was a little door with a knocker. Kay knocked at the door and a little old man opened the door and said, Will you please walk in, Master Kay? And what would you like to see? The treasures or the work? I should like to see both, Kay said. And the little old man opened a door and there was a little furnace with bellows and an anvil, with little men hard at work making, making extraordinary things out of metals and precious stones. In cases on the wall there were the most marvellous weapons and knives, coats of armour, crowns and jewels, and there were also strange things shaped like hands, and when the little men pressed a button these hands took hold of hammers or tongs and plucked molten metal from the furnace and beat it into whatever shape the little man ordered. Kay was so delighted with these things that he stared and stared and stared, and at last one of the pairs of hands plucked a piece of gold, beat it rapidly into the shape of a little rosebud, and thrust it into Kay's buttonhole. The little old man said it would be time for him to be going, and led him to the stone door on the hillside, where the sort of boat harnessed to a wild duck. When he got in the boat, the wild duck flew with it high into the air over the dark woods and then down and down and down, until at last the boat was just over Sea King's house, and Kay had only to drop down the chimney, as it seemed, into his room. And there he was in his room, snapping the box and putting it back into his pocket. And just as he snapped it into his pocket, there came a clattering at the door. Kay! Kay! Mariah said. What is it? Kay said. What isn't it? She said. Come down at once! In the study, she showed him a paper. Look at this, she said. There's a special edition of the paper. They've got the whole cathedral staff. No, Kay said, they can't have. They have, though, Mariah said. Look here. And the special edition was a single sheet, still damp from the press, and the big black headings easily smudged. Unparalleled atrocity. More horrors at Tachester. Have the Bolsheviks begun? A feared terrible plot. A reign of te terror in the cathedral city and there was a note we had thought that the mystery attached to the disappearance of the eminent clergy of the Tachester establishment would by this time have been cleared up with the return of the bishop the dean and the canons to their functions we regret to say that our confidence was gravely misplaced tonight we have to report the complete disappearance of the vesturer, the bursar, the canon's minor, the archdeacon, the vergers, the organist, and its feared other members of the cathedral staff. These gentlemen, according to their custom on the afternoon before Christmas Eve, were proceeding in a motor bus to the Tachester Arms Houses, laden with suitable offerings for the old men, men and women pensioners. They set off, according to custom, at half past three, and it's thought they were beguiled into entering a motor bus other than the one sent for them. From that moment, no word has been received from any of them. Anyone able to throw the slightest light upon this very dark mystery, I adjured to communicate at once with the local police, telephone taxes to 7,000, and to spare no pains in bringing the offenders to justice. "'What time is this?' Kay said. "'It's nine o'clock,' Mariah said. "'We've been wondering where on earth you've been.' "'Oh,' Kay said, "'I I suppose I fell asleep.' "'What a very sh pretty shiny buttonhole you've got,' Mariah said. "'What is it?' "'Oh, that's a little rose,' Kay said, looking down. "'And indeed, there in his buttonhole was a little golden rose "'that had been made for him in the mountain. "'I suppose you got it from a cracker,' Mariah said. But just think of their bagging the whole cathedral staff in one swoop. They must have had the brains of buns. You see, they've had warning. The bishop went, the dean went, and then the canons went, and then the whole lot of them go and plunge into a motor bus and are whirled off, very likely into eternity. Well, I hope they've not been wild into eternity, Kay said. They were awfully nice to us, and some of those clergy. We had a lovely party there the other night. What on earth will they do for the Christmas service? We'll get the news on the wireless. We better wait up until then. 
They waited up until the news on the wireless, and they heard that the archbishops were determined that, in the case of need, the services should be held in the cathedral in spite of the absence of regular staff, and that certain clergy had been asked to proceed to Tatchester to officiate if, there was need, if the need arose. The announcer said that the matter was viewed with the greatest seriousness, and that the public was asked to cooperate with the police by giving instant accurate information of a red, white, blue, grey, brown or black motor bus, the colours being given variously by various observers. Proceeding at a frightening pace in the direction of Tatchester, some twenty miles before the alleged some twenty minutes before the alleged outrage, he asked those who had inf any information to give should telephone at once the chief of Tatchester Constabulary, telephone number, Tatchester, 7000. Well, I, th I should think, Maria said, that even the sleuths at Scotland Yard would begin to think they're up against a gang by this time. I should think that gangsters are dropping them biting postcards. Don't you know my methods, Watson? etc. However, I should think we'd better get to bed. We've not heard the end of this yet, and some more of them will be gone. You'll see. They've got the whole boiling, Kay said. I don't see how many more they could get. The choir boys aren't there, Maria said. I think you'll find they've got the choir boys, Kay said. Hmm. Well, I know who they'll get, Maria said, and those are all the clergy who've gone to Tatchester to take office in case. Blithering asses they were to let the gang know that. I say, Kay said, there'll be a fine old Twitter in Tatchester. Well, Maria said, if they survive, they'll have something to talk of as long as they live. Next to being martyred, I should think being scrubbled would be the greatest joy of a clergyman. I should prefer it to being martyred myself, but tastes differ. And with that, she went to put some holly in Jemima's bed, and then retired to rest. Really hope you've enjoyed Chapter 8 of the Box of Delights, and we'll be back tomorrow with the first part of Chapter 9.